you know, one of the things we, we find in Christendom is that there are different varieties and segments of belief. And there's a, there's a segment of Christian believers that have a theological viewpoint, which is commonly known as Calvinism. And the Calvinist view of salvation is that it is totally, 100% all of God's grace. And most of them view that our human response has little or nothing to do with it at all. Because the, the way they see is that they reckon that men, that's you and I, we are so stuck in our sin, so utterly depraved, that it's impossible. It's impossible for men to choose to respond to God's offer of salvation. So not even to able to exercise faith to receive God's salvation. And they use the analogy like it's like a dead body. A dead body is not responsive at all. Even if you cooked up a huge feast and put it beside a dead corpse, the dead corpse is not going to say yum, right? It's, it's just dead. And so that's the analogy. And so they believe that God actually has to reach out to those uh, who are not believers and regenerate, in other words, give them life, spiritual life, and only then can they begin to have faith. And even then, the faith is given by God to them. The problem is, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense biblically. It doesn't make sense experientially. It's really like putting a horse, or rather a cart, before the horse. So uh, what happens is then theological gymnastics has to be done to fit all of this into their theological frameworks. Now, the Calvinists have develop very complex arguments, very sophisticated arguments that seem very formidable. But it can all be pulled down if we can see through the incorrect assumptions. Now, I believe that God's truth is always simpler to explain. If, if it's too complex, if it requires too many exceptions to the rules, then usually it's not correct. Uh, God's truth it tends to be elegant, beautiful, and simple. That's God's way. So why is this important? Well, an incorrect understanding of God's grace and the role of faith is going to mess us up later on in our journey with God, especially for those of us who consider ourselves charismatic. And as a church, we are charismatics. We believe in the power of God that's still available today. The signs, wonders, miracles, all the supernatural gifts of God are available to us today. And we believe that it's very important that we exercise an active personal faith so that we can appropriate the things of God that God has available for us, the power, the authority, the things of God that He has already made available to us. The thing is, the Calvinist approach to faith nullifies our responsibility in this whole area. We believe we have to take responsibility for the growth of our faith, the exercising of our faith. Because faith is about trust. Trust grows especially when we make choices to deepen it. Let me give you an example. If a stranger comes up to you and asks to borrow your car, would you just lend your car to this absolute stranger? How many of you would do this? Nobody put up a hand? Somebody put up a hand? I'd like to borrow your car. <laughs> well, what, what needs to happen usually is we have to get to know this person. We have to come to a point that we can accept, oh, this person is who they say they are. We need to come to a point where we can accept that they actually can drive a car. We have to reach a point where we can accept that they are safe with a car. We have to reach a point where we think they will be safe driving our car and return it to us. Only after that point has been reached, that journey of, of faith or trust, you could say with this person, then when they ask us, can I borrow your car? Say, sure, we can lend you our car because we've now reached a point where we trust them enough. We have faith enough in them. So I want to introduce you to this skill, which is called the angels. Some of you may have heard of this or seen this before. And this angel skill is an attempt to explain our faith journey from somebody who absolutely doesn't know who or what God is to the point of salvation and maturity in Christ. It's talking about this uh, growth in trust, in faith. 
And uh, let me give you uh, an illustration from my own life. When I was young, my mom brought me to Sunday school. And uh, so I was attending Sunday school as a young boy and learning something from the Bible. My faith was probably hovering around two to four. I had some awareness of God. I, I was among some Christians, and I had some interest in Jesus. And then uh, when I was about seven or eight years old, uh, I decided to quit Sunday school because I wanted to spend my Sunday morning reading the Sunday comics. Yep, I gave up Jesus for comics. Comics was far more important than Jesus. That's where I was. And you think, what, Pastor, just a little bit of comics? No. In my time, the comics was two full newspaper pages. And I enjoyed the comics, there's so much of them, I took my time. It usually took 20, 30 minutes to go through all the comics and laugh and enjoy it. And not only that, my dad bought two newspapers on Sunday, two different newspapers. So I had lot. I took up an hour, which is basically the time of my Sunday school, reading comics instead. Now, by the time I was about 15 or 16, my so because of that, I quit, you know. I, was, I didn't go to Sunday school, I forgot all about Jesus. But when I was about 15, 16 years old, my interest was sparked again. And so I, I began to uh, drop by church occasionally, and I went for religious classes in my school to find out a little bit more about Jesus. So probably I was moving from about four and six. I was hoving around there. I was interested. I was kind of investigating. I was beginning to grasp some truths about Jesus. And then when I was about 18, I, I came to Melbourne to study in university, and I, did, I started to attend church regularly. I went to uh, the Bible studies. In fact, I, I went for Bible studies so faithfully, I was better than some Christians. I never missed a Bible study. And so I was probably moving from about seven to nine. I began to understand the implications of the truth. I began to accept some Christian truths. I began to accept some of the implications of becoming a Christian. I was at that point even praying to God, not for everything, but some things. Uh, but I was not yet a Christian because I was not ready. But later, as time moved on, gradually, gradually, you can see that my spiritual journey took years. There was a lot of years, a lot of questions, a lot of discovery, and gradually I reached a point where I crossed the line. The thing is, I don't even know the date. I don't even know the moment in which I crossed the line. Uh, and part of the reason is because the church I was in, they rarely ever gave a salvation or the call. So nobody came to me and said, Wilson, are you going to repent? Are you going to give your heart to Jesus? Nobody said that to me. So I kind of gradually believed, gradually gave my heart to Jesus. And after some time, one day I said, yeah, I, 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 I do believe in Jesus. I do follow Jesus. That was my journey. So I can only tell you, mid-1983, I received Christ. They'll tell you how old I am. <clears throat> so, uh, anyway, the thing is this. My journey experientially doesn't really match the Calvinist theory because it was a gradual process. I, didn't, I did not get saved and then have faith all in that moment of time. Let me give you an example. My own mom. My own mom was a churchgoer goer all her life, and, but she only received Christ in her 50s. But way before then, she was praying regularly, faithfully, every day for her family. So she had some faith in God, just not saving faith. Another classic example would be John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church. John Wesley had some faith in God. In fact, he even became a priest. He even became a missionary. And, and he was in the UK and England, and he went to America as a missionary. Uh, it was an utter failure, by the way. Well, that's not surprising given that he wasn't even safe. So on his way back, he realized, why, why? He was greatly troubled in his soul. Why, why do I feel so insecure? Why, why am I not certain about some of my salvation? And if you read his history, that was when he began to realize that the important thing was he needed to trust in Jesus. And then was when he came to Christ. By the way, uh, that's why John... Uh, Wesley, he's absolutely not a Calvinist, if you know the history of John Wesley. Now, some of you may have gone through that kind of a journey yourself. Your journey to Christ was gradual. Your journey to Christ was like this 
angel scale, and you could see this sort of progression happening. Maybe some of you trusted in Jesus a little here, a little there, a lot more there, until finally one day you made the decision somewhere along the way that you can trust Him with your life, that you can trust Him to be your Lord and your Savior. Now, this can also explain why some people struggle. Even though they come to Christ, they reach this point, and they, because they're still growing in their faith, they do have struggles, they do have doubts, they have challenges. And this is something we've got to think very carefully about, and that is this. If God was the one who gave us our faith, our personal faith, why would God give us such a weak and a wavering faith? Because if God gives something to us, surely He will give something perfect, complete in itself. So th this is why we believe mentoring is so important, is to help people as they're in this phase that they can help them work through some of their doubts, their struggles, the challenges of adjustment, and so forth. Now, on the other hand, some of us came to Christ in a far more dramatic way. It's like one day, nah, Jesus, God, no way. The next day, whoa, hallelujah, now I'm, I'm ah, I know now, Jesus is real, I give my heart to Jesus. Some of us, may have gone to Christ in that way. And so, if you came to Christ this way, you might say, oh yeah, that's probably the grace of God. God saved me. Boom, that's why now I have faith and I believe. Well, can I suggest to you that probably what happened to you was you had a compressed timeline. This happened to you, bang, in one day or a matter of hours. That is possible. But you know what? It didn't happen to me. You know why it doesn't, it doesn't happen to me? I'm the typical scientific researchers like I have to investigate, I have to collect the data, I have to analyze data, I have to reach some conclusions, make up my mind. That's me. That's why it took me a long time, or somewhat long time, to work this through. Now, that's why when I became a Christian, I had little doubts. Because I worked through many of the issues, the questions that I already was compiled, a whole bunch of questions. I worked through those. By the time I came to Christ, fine, I've settled my questions and my doubts. Some of you, because you didn't sort through those things, so when you, after you came to Christ, you still had all these doubts and questions that you had not yet sorted out. Now, whether or not you took a long journey or a short journey, it's fine. There's neither right nor wrong. It just happened to be the route that you have taken. But can I say this? Whichever way you're going, maybe you're still on that journey, can I encourage you? Make that journey. Make that investigation. Discover the things so that you can make up your mind. But the key is, you have to make up your mind. Now, can I have a quick survey? How many of you were those that was one day, no, I didn't believe in God, and then the next day, bang, I do. How many of you are like this? Can you raise your hands? Come on, be honest here. Surely there must be some. Nobody? I don't believe this. Even my wife put up a hand this morning for that. Okay, how many of you this one? You say, it took me a while. Come on, be honest here. What about the rest of you? you, you are you safe? If you, <laughs> you, you got to be one or the other. Don't say that you're floating somewhere. All right. So think about this. I think this is important. So this is experientially, we can see that there is a journey. And this journey tells us that faith comes before salvation. There's a progression. There's a growth in faith, in trust before we reach the point that we come to Christ. Now, let me dive in, and we're going to consider this whole issue scripturally. So turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 to 7. I'm going to look at the fact that God's grace is what saves us. Let's look at verse 4 to verse 7. It says, But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgression. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might show His incomparable riches of His grace, expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So verse 5 makes it very clear. By grace you have been saved. Now, some of us may ask, what actually is this grace? Well, grace can be described by this acronym. It says, God's redemption at Christ's expense. Or, in other words, grace is God's 
unmerited favor. It means favor that's given whether or not you are deserving. Favor that's given even though you have no way to gain the merit. You have no way to earn this grace. And that's because we are absolutely unrighteous in the eyes of God. Nothing we do, no matter what you do, you cannot possibly earn the brownie points to go to heaven. You just cannot do it on your own effort. Because the Bible says we were dead in our transgressions. We were dead in our sins. We were absolutely dead. And what we, what we need to know what it means. To be spiritually dead does not mean that our spirit is absolutely dead wood inside. That's not what it means. The corpse analogy is incorrect. It just means that our spirit is naturally oriented away from God. It's, it's going away from God. It doesn't want to know God. It, it rejects God. That's where our natural state uh, is. And what the, theologically, we call this total depravity. Some of you may have heard of that term. It means we are utterly and totally, morally, spiritually corrupt in our sins. Our sins has permeated every area of our life. We are absolutely corrupted by sin. And so we're so spiritually lost, we utterly lost, that we cannot and would not seek God. We would not go for God all by ourselves because that is our natural state of being. And that is why God had to take the initiative. God had to reach out to us because we would not. God was the one who has to pay the price, obtain for us forgiveness, in order that he may save us. That's why Jesus sacrificed himself on the cross. Just imagine if, with me sitting on this chair, imagine if, when, if I'm sitting on a chair like this, can I lift this chair? I can't. I can't lift this chair because I'm on the chair. In the same way, when sin is in our heart, we cannot possibly save ourselves. We can't remove the sins ourselves. The only way I can lift this chair is if somebody else comes and lift me up with the chair. In the same way, the only way we can be saved from our sins is because God came to save us from our sins. Now you may ask, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus sacrifice for us? Well, in verse 4 and 5, it helps us understand that it's because of God's great love for us. Because of God's great mercy. He's merciful. He says, wow, I got to help these people who are utterly lost in their sins. And so despite the fact we were so dead spiritually, we were so rejecting, we were so ignorant of God, we couldn't care less about God. But God says, I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to save these guys. I'm going to give them an opportunity that they can respond and come back to me. And that's why God is offering us forgiveness, salvation through Jesus Christ. It is purely the work of grace on God's part to us. Now, God, He could have executed judgment immediately. The judgment of God is death. But God could have immediately said, well, I'll do it now. But, God, but instead, God said, I'm going to allow them to have a probation period. I'm going to give them a chance of their, consider their uh, human lifetime. They will have a chance to make that decision and turn it around to me. So God was very gracious in doing that for us. He is giving everyone an opportunity to respond to the good news that Jesus came to die for us in our place. Now, some of us may be asking theologically, well, hold on a minute. If man is totally depraved in sin, how can man respond to God's grace? Is it, you know, the dead cop's analogy? Well, God's grace is simply this. God will move upon our hearts to draw us to him, to gradually draw us to him. And how does he do this? He does this by persuading us. Usually he sends others to come to tell us, to share with us, to persuade us about the reality of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, he enlightens us. He helps us open our eyes and say, whoa, okay, this might be true and, and so forth. And he convicts us by the Holy Spirit. He works upon our heart. The Holy Spirit knocks at the door of our heart and says, hello, hello, you better pay attention to this thing. I'm knocking at your door. Are you going to listen? And that's what God does in many, many different ways and so forth to us. 
if you think of it this way, look at this rubber band. It's a little rubber band. This is the natural state of this rubber band. That's, is, that's what this rubber band is. But if you imagine this as us in our state of sin, totally depraved and uh, unresponsive to God, God comes and He says, I'm going to help you stretch and grow in your faith, in your trust. And if I can use, oops, let's see, I can get this back in. And it's almost like here we are, no awareness of God. And God says, I'm going to stretch this, this guys. I'm going to grow their understanding, their faith, their trust in me to the point that they can now respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ and make that decision, make that choice to say, yes, I do want and I do need Jesus in my life. But what happens when after stretching somewhere here and we reject, we turn away, we say, no, 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 I, I don't want to accept this, we bounce straight back because our natural state has not changed. We're still sinners before God. The key we've got to understand is this. Man, us, we can choose to respond positively. And whenever we respond positively, we can start moving up. Let me give you an illustration. Maybe you were in contact with some Christians and you met them. and You begin to know they're Christians. And after meeting them, hey, they're, they're pretty nice. They're cool, man. And, uh, and say, hey, I, I'm interested in this Jesus you, you told me about. So you got a bit more interest. And as you get more interest, they tell you more and you accept it. You trust it, what they say. They say, okay, well, I want to find out more. You begin to investigate. And as you go on positively, you begin to proceed. But if you were in contact with these Christians and they really turn you off, guess what? You probably don't want to mix with them. You might come to the point you're no longer in contact with them because you separate yourself, you kick them out of your life. And so being negative will just move you downwards in this step. And so wherever we are as we go, we can move forward or backwards depending on our attitude. Are we going to accept or reject uh, God's grace that's seeking to work upon our lives? And the thing is this, in all this journey, it is only possible because of the grace of God. And so, God's grace is foundational to our salvation. Can you tell a neighbor, foundational? It's foundational. And we need to grasp this thing. Now, let me go on. The second key I want to explain to us is that faith is not works. Let's look at verse 8 and 9. It says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Now, guys, I'm going to start diving in deep. Okay, hang on with me. Now, the Calvinists, they argue that if men exercise faith, it is a form of work. Why? Because it came from us. We did something. And so if we did work, then surely it's not right. It doesn't match Scripture because the grace of God is... Salvation is 100% the grace of God. So that's why they say faith must actually be a gift from God. But we've got to ask ourselves this question. Does God consider our exercise of faith a form of human work? Does God actually do that? Well, we've got to examine this according to the Scriptures. So let's do that. I'd like us to look at... oh. Okay, I forgot that bit, but this one, Romans chapter 4. Now, this looks a bit intense, but we're going to dive in. Romans chapter 4, verse 2 to 5. It says, If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God. Let's skip the Greek for now. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Okay, now what I want to point out is this. The meaning, the work, when you look at the word work, this meaning is deeds. The work in Greek is ergon. Does this sound familiar? Big company in Queensland? You all don't pay electric bills, all right. <clears throat> okay. Um, works is contrasted, uh, so, first of all, works is about deeds, human deeds, what you do, your actions. 
But faith means trusting God. That's what it means, basically. And I want to point out to us that the word belief, which in the Greek is epistusen, it, it, it comes from the root pistio. Okay, just keep that. You don't have to know exactly what it means, but just keep that in mind. Who does know but believes, which is the word pistionti, it also comes from the root word pistio, and faith, which is pistis, also comes from the root word pistio. In other words, the word believe and the word faith is actually the same meaning, same word. Now, you might say, why didn't, God, why didn't the translators just use the same word? Well, they had a problem with the English language. English is quite limited because if they tried to use all the same word faith, they would have said Abraham faithed, which doesn't exist. And, now, uh, and who does not work but believes, they will say who faiths, which doesn't in- exist in English. That's why they use the word belief. You understand what I'm trying to say? So in this whole passage, the comparison, the contrast is between work and faith. So now the Apostle Paul in writing this, he was inspired to do this. He was arguing against the Jewish Christians. The Jewish Christians kept coming back and saying, how can you be saved by just trusting in Jesus? You need to be, follow all the laws of Moses. You need to be circumcised. You need to observe Sabbath. You need to do all the ceremonies, the, the religious days, all those things you need to do as well. And Paul the Apostle is saying, no, 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 you got it wrong. Jesus came to save you on the basis of you trusting in Him, full stop. There's nothing you can do to justify yourself before God. So, what we need to understand then is to go through the logic of his argument. Let's look again more closely. Verse 2. If Abraham was justified, justified by works, he has something to boast about. If Abraham could gain salvation, if he could gain credit before God on the basis of what he did, then, it, then you can just imagine Abraham coming to his friends. Hey guys, you see this righteous crown I got from God? Man, I worked my butt off to get this thing. Man, it was so challenging, but I made sure I was a very good guy. Man, am I not incredible? Abraham could have said that, right? But the Bible says, but not before God. Abraham cannot boast of what he did or what he's done because God would not accept that. But instead, what the Bible says in verse 3, verse 3, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Imagine this way. Abraham was lazing away outside of his tent. He was lying down on his nice recliner chair, sipping a Coke and watching television, you know, or whatever. And, and God spoke to him and said, Hey, Abraham, you will be, your descendants will be as, uh, you know, immense as this. Look at the stars in the sky. If you can count the stars, these are how many your descendants will be. And the Bible said, Abraham simply believe. He's like, he didn't do a thing. There was nothing that he did. He just trusted God. He had faith in God. So what we see is that Abraham's faith, it prompted God to say, ah, Abraham, you believe. I consider you righteous because you trusted me. That's God. So now, I just want to point out, we're not talking about saving faith here. We're just talking about generic faith. Just trust. Abraham just trusted God on the promise that God had given to Abraham. And so, when Abraham trusted God, God says, I'm going to give you a gift called righteousness. I'm going to consider you righteous. So, Abraham can go now and say, I'm a card carrying guy, righteous. No, I'm just joking, okay? It doesn't actually exist, but... That's, but does God consider him righteous because of his faith? And so what we can see here, and it's brought out again in verse 5, and to the one who does not work but believes. See, the Bible is making very clear. There's a huge contrast between work and faith. They're not the same thing. God does not consider our faith, our exercising of faith to be a work. God doesn't do that. Exercising our faith is not a form of works. In fact, when you look in the scripture, faith is never considered to be a human work that deserves any merit from God. Think about that. Typically, there's no such concept, actually. And this is reinforced throughout scripture. Why? Think about this. So many times in scripture, you find God challenging people to believe. Why would God challenge them to work? 
which is human effort. Why would God? God doesn't challenge us to express human effort. God challenges people to trust in Him. So this tells us throughout the Scriptures, too, is reinforced all the time, faith is not works. They're both not the same thing. Because works is about our deeds, tangible actions on our part. Faith is our attitude of trusting in God. It's intangible. Faith is not works. Can you tell a neighbor, faith is not works? So I, I hope I've unraveled to you and showed you, unpacked for you, that faith is not works. Now let me go on now. Let's dive. Guys, we're going to dive even deeper. Are you coming along with me? We're going in submarine mode. Third point I want to share with you. Salvation is the gift, not faith. Ephesians 2, verse 8 to 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So I'm going to show you here now that in the Scripture, faith is not the gift, as the Calvinists would say, but actually is salvation. To do that, we're going to have to look at the grammar, okay? Now, in the English language, the sentence structure is ambiguous. Why? When you read the word this and this, what does it refer to? Is it the grace? Is it the faith? Is it the fact you've been saved? What is the this? The Calvinists say this refers to faith. This is the gift that God has given to us. Now, what you need to understand is that in the Greek, your nouns and pronouns you have gendered. In other words, it can be feminine, masculine, or neuter. That means no gender. Example is in English. Now, English has gendered nouns and pronouns, but not as much as Greek. So, chairman, chairwoman, chairperson. Chairman is male, chairwoman is female, chairperson is neuter, okay? And when we we'll call a person chairman, you say he. When you call a chairwoman, you say she. When you say a a chairperson, I don't know what you call them, it. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Now, in the Greek, grace and faith are feminine. Now, let me sh show this to you. For it is by grace, charity is Greek feminine, a feminine noun of charis. Through faith is pistios, a Greek feminine noun of pistis. So it's in the feminine. But when you come to the word this, it's total. It's a Greek neuter. It's non-gendered. So you have a problem. Why isn't it in the feminine? At least if it's going to match with faith. Whenever a neuter uh, pronoun is used, it usually refers to the things prior to it. And in fact, if you look about it carefully, this is referring to the entire theme of salvation that we read about just now, about salvation is by the grace of God. And in particular, it could have pointed to you have been safe. So uh, it's talking about salvation. And just to let you know, in case you, you don't realize, you look through the book of Ephesians, there's quite a lot of this. For example, chapter 1, verse 15, you can look at the this. It refers to verse 3 to verse 14, the preceding section. Chapter 3, verse 1, it, re it refers to the segment in chapter 2, the last half. Uh, chapter 3, verse 14, it refers to the verse, first 13 verse. This is always the preceding section. So this, this is referring to the preceding section, not faith. Quite straightforward, right? This is just simple, straightforward grammar. I just, we just have to dive into the Greek. But let me look at another one. Let's look at syntax, the sentence structure, and begin to look into this. There are three complements in that sentence after this, all right? What are compliments, some of you are asking? Well, compliments mean, basically describes an abstract noun. That means an idea or an object, or more than an object. So the compliment describes what type of uh, uh, abstract idea it is. So if faith was the this, then you would get true faith. And this not from yourself, it is the gift of God, not by works. Three separate compliments. Now, the first two would suit the Calvinists perfectly. Faith this is not from yourself. Yep, take. Faith, it is the gift of God. Take. Faith, not by works. Well, you have a problem because faith is never the result of works. In fact, we already showed to you faith and works are absolutely two separate things. 
is, so to say this, it's almost like saying black is not white. Uh, why are you saying this? Everybody knows black is not white. White is not black. Faith is not works, works is not with. So it doesn't make sense when we do this thing. However, if the noun should, is salvation, you have been saved, and this is not from yourself, it is the with, gift of God and not by works, then it makes perfect sense because it's rhetorical almost. It's like saying salvation is not your own doing. Salvation is the gift of God. Salvation is not the result of works. It's just very nice and neat and clean. We can't save ourselves. So having looked at all this, that's why I'm saying uh, salvation is the gift. It's not talking about faith. Now, in fact, when you look through scriptures, no scripture describes our exercise of faith, that attitude of trusting in God as a gift from God. Nowhere. You search through scripture. Nowhere will it say faith is a gift. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, when it talks about the gift of faith, is the charismata gift of faith, the supernaturally enabled faith, where God comes and supernaturally gives us that supernatural kind of faith. It's not the kind of faith we exercise because it's given by God. So it's not the same type of faith we've been talking about here. There are other scriptures which talk about faith that is in Christ and so forth. It's talking about the substance, the content, the truth of our faith. It's not talking about the trust, the trusting aspect of faith. So once you understand this, you will, you will not find any scripture that talks about faith being a gift that God gives to us. So we can conclude that salvation is the gift from God, not faith. How many say amen? Can you now come up from the, underneath the water? <laughs> okay. So what we've shown theologically is that God's grace is foundational to our salvation. I'll just ask the worship team to come. And so what it's saying is this. It is because of His grace that salvation has been made available to us. So nobody, none of us can earn salvation for ourselves. It's not what you do. It's not what you can do. It's not what you have already done. Some of us may look at our lives and say, I mucked up so bad. I'm so horrible. I'm so terrible. I'm so hopeless. Surely God will not accept me. Well, God says, I'm not looking at any of those things. No matter how good, no matter how bad. None of it that God takes into consideration. Because God says, it's not about you it's what my son Jesus has done for you the key thing that God is asking of us is will we choose to trust will we have that attitude that says okay God I'm going to trust you I'm going to place my faith in you that you did what you did because you love me so much you did what you did because you had great mercy on me in all my brokenness yet you are willing to forgive me and I now know I'm the one that have to make the decision to accept what Jesus has done and to turn to God and trust in Him. God, can I also say this just that I get the right nuance with you right now and I'll talk about this more next week. God, by His grace, He does enable us to be able to reach a point where we can exercise that faith. So we didn't just reach it all by ourselves. God helped us. Remember, I was showing you the graph of the angel scale. At every point, God was bringing people. The Holy Spirit was working upon our life. He was opening our mind to understand. He was helping us. But it is as we respond positively, we're taking that step coming closer to Him, to God. Let me try to illustrate this. Imagine if you had a fear of flying. You really don't trust the aeroplanes. You, you don't want to get onto a plane. But you have a friend that wants to help you. So your friend sits down with you and begins to explain to you how planes fly and show you why it's so safe to fly on a plane. That it's actually safer to fly on a plane than to drive a car on the highway. And then your friend arranges for you to meet the pilot of the plane. And the pilot explains to you how he flies the plane. He tells you all the safety mechanisms on the plane. He shows you how many hundreds, if not thousands of hours he has flying planes. He's showing to you how safe 
the plane will be in that pilot's hands. Then your friend says, not only that, I bought you a ticket to fly on the plane. Free. And not only that, I bought myself a ticket and I'm joining you. I'm going to sit beside you. I'm going to be right there with you so that you can feel safe flying on the plane. You did not do a single thing to get onto that flight. All you need to do is to accept what your friend has done, take the ticket, and get on board. That's all. You don't have to do anything else. Coming to Christ is as simple as that. God has done everything, everything necessary that you may be forgiven. God has done everything to help draw you to this point that you can respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. The question is this, will you accept the offer and make that decision to turn to Him. That is the big thing that God is asking us. Can we all stand? We're going to spend a moment and we're going to just pray in a little while. Let's open our hearts even to God right now. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for your incredible grace. Your grace which is so immense, so immeasurable. That your heart is so big that you forgave us, Lord, our sins. Lord, we were caught, stuck in our sins. And Lord, we can, we can see the evidence of our sins, the selfishness, the unforgiveness, the bitterness anger, the jealousy, all these things, Lord, we can see is just evidence of this sin that's gripping us in our heart. And Lord, your word says that because you're so holy, you have to deal with that. You have to judge it. But Lord, at the same time, you love us so much that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross each one of us. Oh Lord, help us understand this. That Lord, it is your grace and your grace alone. That's the reason why we can be safe. But help us understand as well that we have a responsibility to trust. And that is our part, that is our choice. Help us Lord where we lack. Maybe there's some amongst us even right now even right now that you've come to realize that in some way you've been trying to earn your way into God's favor. You may even be safe already, but you're still trying to earn your way into God's favor. And you can't do that because that's not how it works. God looks at your faith. It's on the basis of what He has already done. And if you've been trying to earn your way into God's favor, that's why you've been struggling that's why it's been disappointing and difficult and then if that's you today i want to give you an opportunity to respond to god and come back to god and say god forgive me i got it the wrong way around i realize now you have already forgiven me i am your child lord help me not to try to earn but lord to serve because i want to I love to.